In this video, I'm going to show you how to calculate standard errors and margins of errors based on what we know from the central limits theorem about sampling distributions. Let's go ahead and review our formula for our standard error. Our standard error formula is given as sigma sub y bar. The y bar is important here because it tells us that this is a sampling distribution or a distribution of means. And sigma, of course, means that it's a measure of variability, basically a standard deviation. This is going to be equal to sigma sub y, not y bar, divided by the square root of n. So if we know sigma sub y, our population standard deviation, and we know a sample size, we can go ahead and calculate different standard errors. For this problem, I'm going to assume that sigma sub y is equal to 10, just to pick a number. Of course, this would be a number you would derive from your actual data. And we're going to use different sample sizes. For example, we use a sample size of 25, a sample size of 100, a sample size of 400, and a sample size of 1600. So I'm going to calculate four different standard errors. Our first standard error is equal to sigma sub y bar, which is equal to 10 divided by the square root of 25. In this case, this is going to be equal to 2. Square root of 25 is 5, 10 divided by 5 is 2. Let's move on to our second sample size. Here, we're going to have sigma sub y bar is equal to 10. So our numerator for this example, for these problems, will always be 10 because that's our population standard deviation, divided by the square root of 100. And this will equal 1. You'll notice that I've picked these numbers intentionally. Um, I have a purpose later that I'll, I'll show to you, but to make this easy to do. Obviously, you can use a calculator if you have any fractional values. Our third standard error It's going to be equal to 10 divided by the square root of 400. And that's going to be equal to 1 half or 0.5. And then finally, our fourth standard error is going to be equal to 10 divided by the square root of 1600. And that's going to be equal to one quarter or 0.25. So a couple of things to notice here. First, as our sample size increases, as we go from a sample size of 25 to a sample size of 1600, our standard errors decrease. And they do this in a very regular pattern. For example, if I look at the standard error for a sample size of 25 and compare it to the standard error for a sample size of 100, and I calculate the ratio of the standard error of the sample size for 100 divided by the standard error for the sample size of 200, uh, sorry, 25, you can see that I decrease my standard error by one half. And this is a very regular pattern. Every time you increase your sample size by four times, 25 to 100 is a four times increase, your standard error is cut in half. So the, these numbers for the sample sizes, 25 to 100 is a four-fold increase, 100 to 400 is a four-fold increase, and 400 to 1600 is a four-fold increase. And each time, I'm decreasing my error in making estimates by one half. And as I've mentioned in class, one of the more expensive things that you can do is collect data. And every time you want to cut your error in half, you have to quadruple your sample size. Let's now look at a problem where we take our standard error and we scale it by a factor to create what some people call the margin of error. To review, we know that our standard error, sigma sub y bar, is equal to sigma sub y divided by the square root of n. And in the examples we've used, we've let the sigma sub y be equal to 10. And in this case, I'm going to select a sample size of 1,600. And 
and go ahead and get a standard error of 0.25. Now, in a normal distribution, we know that if we move from the center of the distribution, the mean of y, and we move out towards the tails equally in either direction, we can cut off different areas of this distribution. If we convert from our original metric, however our variable is measured, to a z-score metric, we know that if we move out 1.96 standard deviations in the positive direction and 1.96 standard deviations in the negative direction, that the middle of this distribution captures approximately 95% of the distribution. That is, this area that I'm shading in over here is 95% of the distribution. If I were to push those bars further out, say to 2.58, I would capture the middle 99% of the distribution, and I could push them even further to 3.29 and capture 99.9% .9 of the distribution. So these three numbers are typically used in inferential statistics to talk about a 95, 99, or 99.9% .9 confidence interval. And all we're going to do is take our standard error and scale it by those three numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and calculate my margin of error, which typically is going to be equal to some z-score times a standard error. And in this case, I'm going to have three z-scores. I'll use 1.96, 2.58, and 3.29. And I'm going to go ahead and calculate my first margin of error. And I'll use the subscript 95 to indicate it's a 95% margin of error. And it's going to equal 1.96 times 0.25. And that's equal to 0 0.4900. My second margin of error will be 99. And that will be equal to 2.58 times 0.25, which is equal to 0 0.6450. And finally, my last margin of error which I will label as 99.9, .9, is equal to 3.29 times 0.25. And that's equal to 0.8225. You can see here, as we go from 95 to 99 to 99.9, .9, that our margins of error get larger, as you might expect. That's equivalent to taking those bars on that normal distribution and pushing them further away from the mean in both the positive and negative direction to capture an increasingly large portion of the distribution. We're going to show you in a later video how to use these concepts to calculate and to interpret confidence intervals, which are very typically done in descriptive statistics in, um, in the social sciences. As always, if you have questions, please contact us and we'll do our best to help you.